You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The 4x4 podcast, episode 141. You're listening to the 4x4 podcast, the podcast all about four-wheeling, overlanding, off-road racing, and the outdoor lifestyle. We talk about news, tips and tricks, answer your questions, and interview big and little names in the off-roading world. So whether your rig is busted and you're in the shop wrenching on it, or you're on your way to the trail, join us and we'll keep you plugged in on topics to help you get away. Here are your hosts, Dan, Craig, and Rich. Well, hello guys. How are you doing tonight? Hey, hey, just wonderful. Doing good? Awesome. Well, those that, you know, since it's an audio podcast, you can't tell that Rich is in full retirement mode. He's got a giant (laughs) beard coming in. Does that that increase your off-roading skills? Is that? I mean, there's, there's lots does. of things that it improve does. with the beard. So I haven't. Yeah, it's it definitely increases your your off road ability cred. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, before we get into talking about all the news and, and our interviews, because we've actually got two interviews, I'm going to stuff into this episode. Uh, wanted to let you know that this episode of the Four by Four Podcast is brought to you by LT Wright Knives. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LT Wright knife. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com. So, uh, this show uh, is an all-ram truck show. So, uh, if you are a Chevy or a Ford lover, uh, then you can just send us in all the feedback and tell us why we're wrong. Um, But since... Since there are a couple of Mopar fans here on this uh, podcast, it's going to be a tough sell, but I challenge you. <laughs> tell me we're wrong. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is a Jalopnik article that points out that this is the last year you can buy a new full-size pickup truck with a manual transmission. Um, and honestly, I didn't even realize you could still buy a... Uh, we're talking the Ram 2500 with a manual transmission. So, um, Craig, what do you think? Is this a, a sad thing, or or should we just not care because automatic transmissions are the way of the future? Well, they are the way of the future because uh, we, we've talked about it before. Automatic transmissions eventually are going to get better and better and better and better. <laughs> They're in semis now. They're eight to 10 speeds in the semi trucks and they're automatic. Some of those are automatics. They drive like crap, but they're (laughs) there. Okay. I've driven one. I told my boss, don't give me it again. I'll take the manual. I'm a manual guy. I would rather have my tow vehicle be a manual. Um, but so I heard the new 2019, you cannot get, a manual transmission because it is already a six speed transmission. I think they're going to an eight speed transmission eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in our next article. Um, but you know, I'm a fan of the automatic transition transmission because it gives me all of the control in the world. If I miss a shift, I can only blame myself. Uh, and from what I can tell, they are far more reliable and definitely a lot easier to work on. Um, if you've ever cracked open, the inside of an automatic transmission and you see all those channels and valleys and like, I don't know. It's filled with voodoo is all I can tell. Like, I don't understand what all's going in there. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm okay with the automatic. I mean, if I'm wheeling, I'd rather have an automatic. Hey, I got a manual in my Jeep though. If I'm (laughs) wheeling, I want an automatic. If I'm towing, my tr- truck to the trail. I want a manual. Yeah, how's that? I don't know. How's that I'm manual that transmission? How's that manual transmission working in your Jeep right now? Yeah, well, <laughs> since all the time I spent doing with the, uh, you know, going getting ready for SEMA and doing SEMA and doing all that. Yeah, I ran out of money to do anything else. So, yeah. and it's been co- a little cold here for this California boy. Uh, so I haven't been in the garage at all. I don't know. I unfortunately I grew up I grew up with manual transmissions. Um you know, I've lived in suburbs in the country, in the city, and 
when I finally decided to bail on manual transmissions was when I was living in the city. I was like, my, my left calf was just like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? stop and go traffic we're, with the manual transmission is a little bit of a chore. No traffic, they're great. You're in traffic, they suck. Yeah. We all yeah. know that. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's not like if you're out for a Sunday drive, there's nothing but grabbing up, grabbing that shifter and pounding those gears. It's just fun. Yeah, it's, I don't know. Like you said, it's it's been – they've slowly – well, actually, they haven't been slowly going away. It's I think Ram was the last holdout, but I think everybody built on manual transmissions a long time ago. Yeah. It's and, not full, and full-size trucks. Yeah, I think that's the, the kind of the thing we want to specify is you can still get a manual in a mid-size truck like the Tacoma or the Frontier. Um, I don't right. know if you can get it in um, in the new the Colorado. Ranger. Yeah, I no, you can't get yeah, it in you Colorado. Can, you can get Just it in Colorado. The Toyota, I think, is still uh, it still has option of a manual. Yeah, so yeah. you can in still fact, get that's it. That's the only way the... to get long bed Tacoma is to get a manual transmission. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm backwards on that. You have to have an automatic. I, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> you can, there's, there's a certain transmission you cannot get a long, a long bed. <laughs> His retirement is getting to him. Um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard the reason why that they're not gonna, they're not offering a manual transmission anymore is because nobody's buying them, and that's what sets the thing. But you also got to remember, it's not the 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 particular the particular person, like myself, Dan. Yeah, we are not the average consumers. I guess that's we're kinda... not the average consumer, but that's the thing that making the decision it's not us that's making the decision it's the dealerships the dealerships aren't ordering them to put them on the lot for a customer to buy because the customer will more likely buy an automatic me and you go into the dealership we we're gonna buy a new truck well oh wait oh you know it's an automatic you know oh okay it's a good looking truck oh i'd i'd rather have a manual but it's already here. It's an automatic. I'm going to buy that. Yeah. And that's what most people do. So well, that's why they're phasing out the manuals. No, I think there's some, some finance aspect to it for the manufacturers. They're like, well, we're going to get, we're just not going to continue to make manual transmission for heavy duty trucks. When you've got a very small segment of people that want them, it's just not financially. Yeah. It, they definitely get that the economy too. of scale. And, and that's the reason fewer, fewer different part numbers to try and manage. Exactly. Uh, there's less, expertise or anything on the assembly line. They just keep stuffing the same transmission in and don't worry about the rest. So I got it from the business perspective, but personally I am sad that, uh, that's one more nail in the manual transmission coffin. Um, Oh, well, so next up, uh, is as you were alluding to, uh, the, the updates to the Ram, uh, heavy duty series and now uh the 2019 ram is actually making 1000 pound feet of torque a thousand pound feet like this used to be that was like the benchmark or what people were trying to get their tune or you know put a turbo on whatever to get up to a thousand horsepower but now or a thousand pound feet of torque but now it's it's just coming from that like that's insane with a yeah with a lighter block different heads yeah. Um, a different turbocharger, and it's it's the same. It's the same blueprint. I've heard. The yeah. motor is the exact same blueprint. Just those little couple of things have gotten it up to. I guess it went from three seventy five to four hundred and ten horsepower, and a, from eight hundred and ten foot pounds of torque to a thousand. That's is a that significant. The, I think jump. that's what the numbers were. Um. It's the tow the towing capacity is just crazy. It's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Over thirty five hundred pounds. I yeah, mean, for the, the Do- thirty five hundred series. Stepping the game up, <sighs> making Chevy and Ford keep up. And the payload, seven thousand yeah. six hundred and eighty pounds. Now, to specify, like just to be clear for anybody that's not quite understanding, the towing capacity is what you're hooking up and pulling with it. So I I imagine that 35,100 pounds is with a gooseneck trailer. So it's connecting to the truck uh, forward. I hope so. (laughs) Yeah. You're not doing that on the bumper or on the, on a trailer hitch. Uh, But put, 
put the uh, perspective of the payload is put two Dodge Chargers on top of each other and put them in the bed, and it can still pull it down the road with decency. <laughs> I'd like to see it, that. I mean, I, I'd like to see that. <laughs> 7,500 pounds in the bed of a truck. Yeah, that that is really impressive. Uh, I mean, those used to be old dump truck numbers. Now it's a your daily driver to work number. Oh my God, we're, oof. technology's going over the top now. Yeah. So, man, that's impressive. Uh, I'm interested to see how Ford, with their super dirty, answers this uh, 100 or 1,000 uh, pound feet of torque. Uh, that, that's... You think, now what? Now let's both let's let's all take a vote. Who do you think is going to try to get there first, Chevy or Ford? Well, you know I've seen Chevys and theirs is just ugly, so theirs doesn't count. Well, I'm not talking about body style. I'm talking about the horsepower and the torque numbers. Which do you think is gonna is gonna step up their game and try to beat Dodge? Um... So oh, Chevy has know. just gone through a, the most recent update, uh, now followed by Ram. So I think next in the shoot is going to be Ford. So yeah, uh, that would be my guess. So, but like I said, the, the Chevy one. What about Nissan? Yeah. So Nissan, Nissan? they're Nissan's running, supposed to be coming out with a dually. Sure, but a Cummins dually. The Cummins engine that they're running is the Cummins that nobody else wanted. So. I got it. It's a five yeah. liter, whatever Cummins. It, it's still a Cummins. It's a great truck. Uh, I test drove a couple before I went for the Ram. Um, but, you know, that's how they ended up with that, that motor. So, anyways, but the, they're not, you know, they're Nissan is not going to be the so one. So, we have. And, and if I'm wrong, then the guys from the Nissan Nation podcast, uh, they should call <laughs> me and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, but I don't think. <laughs> My money's on Ford. They'll be the ones that come uh, yeah, up. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's yeah. going to be Ford. So Ford was actually right. the closest, anyways. They were already over nine hundred uh, pound feet uh, before Ram came and and bested them. So yeah. So what's the brand? What's the Ford numbers? Are they for nine hundred? They're like nine twenty five. Uh, no, it's higher than that. It was still under nine fifty though. I thought maybe I was wrong. Maybe it's nine seventy five stands out in my memory. Okay, because mine stands out between nine ten and nine forty five. Some yeah, somewhere yeah. in there. That's that's a lot though. That's a lot more yeah. than my eco diesel. I that's mean, for sure. <laughs> so the new Dodge is supposed to have you know thousand foot pounds of torque, new frame, uh, new technology inside and out, new body styling, and uh, also uh, the. I heard that the headlights actually uh, turn up to 30 degrees, I think it was. Huh. And so you're driving down the road, you go to do a turn, it'll actually they'll turn up to 30 degrees as you're going around a turn. That seems unnecessary. Uh, one yeah, more thing well, they're to, going to, to like the BMWs and the Mercedes that yeah. do that. I do like the auto leveling on, on headlights. Uh, you know, a lot yeah. of these newer trucks, they'll have like the air ride suspension like mine's got. You know, once you put something heavy in the bed, or a trailer on it, you know, it starts to squat. Uh, well, that air suspension will come back up and level out the ride, uh, so you're not getting any weird handling uh, thing, and the headlights are actually pointing in the right direction. Uh, so yep. you're not, you know, lighting up the, the trees. <laughs> you can actually see the road. So Yeah, not spi- not uh, what we used to call in the old days, uh, sniper headlights. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> watching the trees. <laughs> Looking up in the tree for snipers. Yep. Well, uh, let's go ahead and jump to our, our last bit of news. Uh, the, the Power Wagon uh, is the other truck in the Ram lineup. The, they got an, an update. Um, Rich, what do, you, what do you think of some of the updates that they've got here? I don't know. It's, you know. It was funny. Somebody asked me today if the truck that I was driving now is the truck that my ultimate truck. And I was like, no, it, it'd be power wagon yeah it's no no doubt i would definitely take a power wagon yeah and i um, I definitely looked at a couple of those but the the truck i got it was a compromise uh, because the the power wagon is awful on gas <laughs> it is <laughs> it, it is but yeah. it, it's awesome it is <laughs> so there's it that is. <laughs> you know you're not wrong um, 
<laughs> so yeah, so it's still got the 6.4 liter Hemi in it, but they've put a new HP transmission in it, and it's it's a really good HP transmission. It's so I've got no issues with that. Uh, the bumper, did you notice the bumper on it? Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. It's got that That's lower air dam on it. Well, I'm really hoping that lower air dam is removable. Oh, it's going to be um, removed, whether you do it or <laughs> something else removes it. It's coming off. Yeah. But uh, it does. It has the integrated Warren winch, and they went ahead and put the the Warren Epic hook on it. So I don't know what the rating is on the Epic hook. I know it comes in three different ratings. But um, yeah. what else? Uh, was it four point seven one to one gear ratio now? Yeah. So I mean, just to be clear, the R- Jeep uh, Wrangler Rubicon has the four to one crawl ratio. This is a yeah. four point seven one to one. Yeah. So that's that'll that'll be nice. You've still got the uh, sway bar disconnects. Um, Locking they went ahead and put. Uh, I don't know if that's new for this year or not, but they put the dial shifter in, uh, as opposed to the column shifter for the transmission. Um, yeah. Ugh. No, I'm a big <laughs> fan. I got to tell you, after yeah. living with it for you know almost a year now. I'm a big fan of the dial. I mean, all it is is it's an electrical connection. Who cares? Yep. I don't care if it's a if it's a column shifter or not. It's an electrical connection. You're doing it just because it feels good to have that column shifter there. You know, who yeah. cares? Um, well, see, and it feels better. You have to not so have much it after more that. center column space now. Yeah. Once you get rid of that, that it, it's it's really nice. But you've still got a manual uh, transfer case shifter in the power wagon, so you can you still you've still got that. Yep. <laughs> It seems well, I funny. like that the front it has the front lock and rear lock, and it, it, it has a switch for front and rear lock, or just the rear locker, and then unlock, and then the I think it has got the hill descent also, and then right. the sway bar disconnect. Yep, that's cool. Um, um, I'm just not a fan of the the turn knob. You get really used to it. <laughs> I mean, Dan, you've got yeah. it in your truck, right, Dan? Yep, yep. And yeah. I'm a fan. It took me yeah, a little I'm bit a to to get used to it because uh, right next to the the shifting knob is also the volume knob. So there's been many times where I thought I was going in, well within the first month, anyways. <laughs> I'd say where I was trying to put it in park, and instead I blow my eardrums out or I, the music turns <laughs> off. But so. You know, and everybody used to say they were like, "What? Happened? I'm going to accidentally shift into reverse when I'm trying to turn down the radio." Yeah, it, it it's not happen. possible. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, for the one, center console. Yeah, the new center console on this thing is what it looks like a uh, 12 inch iPad. Yeah, yeah, you've got the 12. In- you've got the huge screen, which the jury's still out on that. I think people are still having some issues with them. Um, th- you know, this could be an internet. You know how you know how the people always complain the loudest are the ones that you hear, even though they're minorities. What? Angry so people I, on the internet? I don't think the touch screen, I don't think the screen is as big a deal as everybody makes it out to be. I think that's just a few people that are screaming louder than they're, than the people that are not having issues with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so I, overall, I am not a fan of, of shiny surfaces on the dashboard because sunlight right. in my eyes, I hate it. Um, and also the, those kind of touch screens are the capacitive touch versus the right. uh, resistive where, you know, resistive touch, even if you got gloves on or a pencil eraser, you can poke it and it's going to do whatever you tell it to where it's capacitive. You know, you can't have gloves on your finger unless you, you know, bought the, the super fancy gloves, um, which I don't know. Maybe if you're buying a brand new Ram power wagon, you got fancy gloves. Maybe it comes with them. I don't know. I don't know. Why but, are you driving with gloves on? You got a heated steering wheel. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. He got you there, Dan. That's true. He got you there. I will say, though, in negative 35 degree temperatures, it takes a minute for those steering wheels to warm up. Uh, That's what the remote start is for. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You win. The remote start automatically turns on the heated steering wheel in the driver's heated seat. Well, then I'm going to change the subject and talk about Rambox. (laughs) (laughs) Look over here. Ignore that one there. Uh, so the only disappointment I feel about the power wagon is they don't offer the Cummings diesel. Well, and they've said before that they one. never will just because of the added weight. Yeah. 
But so, that's what I would prefer. I would prefer Cummings Diesel in that. Well, then buy uh, a twenty five hundred. Email them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe if you write a sternly worded letter, they will reconsider. Well, I have understood that all these parts are uh, attainable after or through the Mopar uh, uh, yeah, sales so, office. So I think, I'm just going to probably buy a 2500 and put all that stuff on it and make my own power wagon. Yeah, so I do know of somebody that got a 2500 uh, just tradesman edition, um, but it had the power wagon package on it. So it actually had the winch inside the bumper, uh, it had the upgraded suspension bits and the transfer case. And uh, I don't know how much that set him back versus the other options, but it certainly seems like that would be something that, uh, that a lot of people would want. Um, maybe it didn't have the transfer case. Now I think about it, but certainly the bumper and the winch, uh, a nice factory look. But that being said, if you could get a 2,500, uh, with your diesel and then just slide a s- drive over to AEV with a pile of cash in the bed. Th- I'm sure they'll take care. Like they'll oh, hook yeah. you up. Oh uh, yeah. All you'd have to do is order one and with the uh, with the Ram bed or Ram box, um, a 2500 with a Ram box, and then just take it over to uh, no. some paint shop and say, here, give me. <laughs> Paint, I mean, make it look like a power yeah. wagon, and yeah. I need the front bumper and probably side steps See, and fenders. Now we're and talking axles like axles and transfer case. Yeah, <laughs> just get the bed delete option. Uh, <laughs> save that four hundred dollars, and then you know take it over to AV because I mean it, the full AV treatment is is awesome. The prospector is the it is. Uh, that's where it's at. So. Well, they're going to have to completely remodel the Prospector because different fenders, different uh, bumper, um, different running boards. I mean, that's all going to have to be rethought. And the suspension is going to have to be rethought because um, what they do to the front suspension to be able to put 40s on the 2500 yeah. with uh, only a, a it's a two and a half inch lift. Yeah, there's a ton yeah, of engineering that goes ta- into that's going to take some time, and I don't know if if AEV is actually going to be doing oh, a, yeah. a, a prospector for a, no. to continue on with the prospector. I have no doubt that they will, but yeah. <laughs> there's zero doubt in my mind that they're going to go ahead. I mean, they've probably already got it 90 percent done. Yeah, their their headquarters is right next to (laughs) us. Yeah, yeah. We'll just uh, call up our friend uh, AEV Dave and uh, see what he's already got going on. So, give us a scoop. Yeah. Well, and before we start talking about all the things that uh, Rich is going to do to his RAM here soon, I uh, want to tell you a little bit more about LT Wright Knives. From the wilds of Alaska to the searing heat of the outback in Australia, what you will find in the back of a discerning Overland vehicle? None other than an LT Wright Knives Overland machete, of course. These are handmade from 1075 high carbon steel and your choice of either black or natural micarta. Need something that will stand out in the woods? Opt for an orange G10. It won't blend in with your surroundings wherever you wander. LT Wright Knives is a small company with a family feel. Located in Wintersville, Ohio, they have a passion for what they do. Anything from everyday carry to bushcrafting to the aforementioned Overland-specific piece. LT Wright Knives has you covered. Each knife is thoughtfully designed, built, and tested before it heads out the door. Although they look good enough for the display cabinet, these knives are made to work. Put the knife through its paces and know that you're backed by a lifetime guarantee. So carve, slice, and chop to your heart's content. LT Wright Knives is for bushcraft and everyday carry, hunting, cooking, and overlanding. So you have a lot of options. Carry your preferred LT Wright Knives model with pride. You're helping to support an American company that will stand behind their product with a lifetime guarantee and the satisfaction of a job well done. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LT Wright knife. Find out more at ltwrightknives.com. 
Hey, this is Rich. We got Dan and Craig here. And right now we're talking to uh, Casey Steiner from Action Tracks. He makes uh, traction mats right here in the USA. Uh, Casey, how you doing? Hey, guys. Great. Great. Just trying to stay warm here in the Midwest. Uh, getting ready to head back out to the desert. So I'm glad I caught you. We're leaving uh, tomorrow afternoon for uh, uh, Mojave and Mexico and points beyond to, to uh, keep the keep the cars wheels a turn and that's what we do at action tracks yeah. Yeah, that's awesome we're uh now you're based in are you in kansas or oklahoma uh, my home is actually wichita kansas uh people are always surprised uh to find to, to find us uh to meet us where they meet us out at the races and out on the military bases and and so on and so forth but a home is wichita kansas born bred and and so so glad to live here yeah would, would you say they're shocked that you're from wichita that's a little shocked. college sports yes. joke. But that's a bad pun. We are the shockers, indeed. Good one, Dan. I've been saving that one. So, you got a little bit of a racing background, right? That's where we come from. Is a uh, uh, racing, uh, desert racing, in particular. Um, I was a, uh, um, I was an aircraft mechanic. Uh, here in Wichita, Kansas, and then one day walked away from my job at, at Learjet. Uh, Learjet Experimental Flight and said we're going to uh, build race car motors and uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure what happened after that. <laughs> yeah. It's a long story. <laughs> what uh, what series do you guys race in? Uh, we race in uh, Score, Snore, More, uh, um, which almost sounds like a joke. That's uh, uh, <laughs> so, so Southern California off-road enthusiasts, Mojave off-road enthusiasts, uh, Southern Nevada off-road enthusiasts, and uh, – we were actually lucky enough to race in uh, the Luke Soil Short Course at 1.2, which was, uh, I gotta say, that was a real hoot. Yeah, now you sent me a, you sent me a video. I guess you put it up on YouTube about last year uh, with Baja 1000. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We make lots of videos of our, uh, our friends and and, and uh, fellow racers down there. Um, it's uh, it's always interesting to try to race and film and and do stuff like that, but. People can see our videos at uh, our channel on uh, YouTube, which is Desert Warrior, D-E-Z-E-R-T, Warrior. So uh, uh, check them out. We, we have yeah. a lot of fun making videos. You were just showing us a few of your trophies that you had, too. So We got some trinkets hanging around. They're, <laughs> they're mere byproducts of the hard work. <laughs> so, and what are you doing right now? Other than racing, what are you doing? Well... What, what we're re- working on is, and most excited about is trying to make the world's best uh, traction recovery board. Um, we, I brought and, and distributed uh, several of the import uh, boards over the years, and uh, the United States military and the people here in the U.S. wanted a uh, better-made, uh, more economical, U.S.-made recovery traction board. So we've come out with one of those. Um, and it's called uh, Action Tracks, uh, available at usactiontracks.com. Um, that's that's what's occupying all of our time these days. Yeah, and these are says they're 100% made in America, which is a that's nice. Cor- <laughs> yep, that's correct. Uh, raw materials, right down to the uh, uh, the tooling and the box and the stickers. Um, <laughs> That was an adventure. A lot of people told us we could save a lot of money by taking stuff overseas. And uh, and I tell you, boy, I'm sure glad we didn't. Um, from day one in production, I've had nothing but 100% support from all of our American suppliers. And and, and uh, that's what's kept been able to uh, allow us to launch this product off the ground. We, we couldn't have done it with overseas uh, tooling or suppliers. It just, would have, it just wouldn't have been the quality we need. Yeah, and you put up a, a video on Facebook recently that really showed showed uh, the quality of your product, basically the flexibility before it would break. I mean, you just – that thing never broke. I was watching the tires press up against it, and it was just flexing like crazy, and I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, we use them on uh, – um, primarily, like I said, we're, we're – we're a company by racers and, and for racers and off-road enthusiasts and adventures of, of all kinds. But uh, our, our focus and, and one of our goals has always been to 
provide the United our, our 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 young men and women in the United States military with the with the very best products we can. And, and so the vehicles they use are heavy. The M wraps, the the uh, LMTV families, the uh, Strikers. The uh, uh, home V's, which are, are getting replaced now by the uh, JLTVs, which is the joint light task vehicle. Those, those are some big bad dudes, and, and we got to make a tough product to keep those keep those young folks safe. And then uh, I noticed, well, a pretty common problem, I guess, on these traction mats. People start to spin their tires on them, and oftentimes will melt down the the, the studs that are giving you the traction. Looks like you're starting to use uh, metal replacement right. studs. Right. We have uh, uh, two options. We, we have our, our base model, which is made out of a, a, a polymer that DuPont specially makes for us. It's uh, well, you know, a closely guarded trade secret that, that, that it's easier to tell you what it's not, not than what it is. Uh, it's not ABS. It's not PVC. It's not. Yeah nylon it's not polypropylene uh, but um it will hold twenty five thousand pounds on a, on a quarter inch thick wall thickness so wow. it's 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 pretty strong stuff wow well cool we Dang. uh yeah i'm sorry i didn't answer your question though but yeah the the number one problem with the the traction boards is is people not spinning the tires and and to be honest, part of that just comes with using the equipment. It's just like any piece of recovery equipment. You need to use it, learn to get a feel for it. Um, the Our knobs are stronger, and you can replace them, and we do sell them uh, with a Merrick. It's essentially just a U.S.-made uh, a quarter 20 bolt in there. Um, we, we tried manufacturing many different replaceable teeth, but the uh, the lowest I could get the cost, even manufacturing them was two dollars, and mm-hmm. there's seventy two of them per pair, and I've got three kids of my own to feed. Uh, so who wants to buy a five hundred dollar set of tracks? Yeah. Um, so we could put, or I could put American made hardware in there off the shelf that works great and uh, costs about twenty five dollars in hardware and sixty five dollars in labor and stuff to install them. But you can do it yourself, and that's really what I recommend to people. Buy, our, buy the base model. Learn how to use it. As, as you start to lose teeth, uh, which our teeth are stronger, but as you start to lose them, just go ahead and, and drill a quarter-inch hole in there and put a, a piece of replacement hardware in as necessary. Um, everything about our product is designed to be field-replaceable, field-repairable, down and dirty, offer you the best value you can get and it's it's stuff like we as 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 poor desert racers like to buy ourselves you know we just we just want it to work and to be the best price and to get us on down the road i hear you now this may be a dumb question but on your site you've also got these extreme zip ties what are you using what are you using those for is that for bridging them or that is to link, uh, particularly if you've got a group of vehicles traveling. Um, our, our action tracks are designed with little one-inch uh, slots in the end. It's an improvement on a linking system to turn them into an actual road. Um, that way, say you've got five, six, eight, ten vehicles on patrol, and each has a pair or two of the action tracks. You can, in a, literally a matter of minutes, pull these down, link them together, and make a semi-permanent road that you can uh, air back up and leave no environmental impact nor any trace uh, in, 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 a, in a short order. Um, so these are, you can also use them in that way if you need to make a temporary entrance or exit into a large campground or a forward operating base or maybe a reconnaissance spot or any type of number of areas that you might want to access for a short while uh, and then be gone and not leave any uh, um, footprint or environmental impact. Huh. That's really interesting. I would have never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it's a whole lot, when it comes down to actually building road, it's, it's a whole lot cheaper 
even at the cost of the action tracks, to lay these out, link them up, use them for uh, a day, a week, a month, then take them down and be gone. And uh, no one will even know if they were ever there. You do. You've got a few. Uh, I just found them. you got a few pictures on your website of them doing exactly that. Uh, what is it? It's usaactiontracks.com, tracks with an X. That's right. That's right. Yep. I got a question. And, yeah, please. Um, I noticed that they're a lot more flexible than other tracks. Why did you make them so flexible and not a lot harder? It has uh, sure. That's a good. That's a great question. Uh, uh, flexibility uh, versus brittle brittleness or stiffness uh, gives you ultimately your carrying capacity before failure on the tracks. So the more flexible with with these more flexible materials, we're able to carry a heavier vehicle without um, any kind of failure in the tracks. Now, uh, the, we weren't sure if that would be a positive or a negative when we were developing them. We went, we've gone through, at this point, 19 different prototype materials. Um, turns out, we, you know, because one thing we've lost is with the flexibility is some bridging ability. But in, I've, I've got to say, I probably use these recovery tracks as much as anybody in the country, if not in the world, and one of the things I do the very least is bridge. Is bridge. Um, it honestly, and even when I do need to bridge, they, the more flexible, our more flexible models still work fine. You can double them up and nest them um, to increase the stiffness with any of these tracks that nest. Um, however, there's no, I got to be honest. I just I just tell you, there's only two that I'd recommend buying. There's mine and the imports that I used to sell. Um, everything else, it's just a matter of material as far as the amount they're willing to spend to manufacture, and um, I wouldn't trust anything else for a minute. comes down to that old, you get what you pay for, right? Yeah. You get what you pay for. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. And and have, that you, and you'll, have you guys thought of maybe putting your, having a second kind of clip-on item that makes it a lot more solid so you can bridge – a small hole or gap that that you can't yeah and that's an interesting concept uh you, you can still do plenty of bridge and i i have an ex I'd, I'd take our flexible ones and go cross down trees or anything else without a second thought right now if you really if if you hit that perfect gap in the road that's just the tire size eater and you, and you didn't feel and you felt like you needed some more stiffness, you can double the tracks on top yeah. of each other and, and essentially nest them together and you will double the strength, uh, double the stiffness. Yeah. So uh, you, you're talking about the right. perfect size hole, the likelihood of you finding that perfect size hole. I got it. Murphy rules uh, the universe, but it's still extremely, extremely low probability of finding something just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think unless you know, you're given, in the snow. <laughs> well, hey, even wherever then. you are, you'll, you'll, you'll <laughs> well, need what you don't have. Wherever you are, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's true. That's it. Even then, true. you can get ingenuitive and find something to fill in a hole and provide some additional stability or something. But it's funny you mentioned the snow. So that's always been my worry. Uh, so I lived in uh, the interior of Alaska for a couple years, fairly recently, and my worry with any of these like uh, plastic or uh, the other kinds of uh, you know, these traction pads is that as soon as you expose them to negative 30 or negative 40, they're just going to instantly crack. Uh, and so that kind of steered me away. And I know there's other companies uh, that make like aluminum and metal uh, traction pads that actually are, you know, they're cross braced and have a little more rigidity. So they would work as, as a, you know, the unnecessary bridging solution. Um, but have you tried these out in some extreme cold temperatures? Yes, absolutely. Um, we use them in, in – I personally used them at the, at the tops of 14,000-foot uh, passes up in Colorado in, in you know, zero-plus temperature, zero-minus temperature. Uh, the manufacturer rates the raw material down to a negative uh, 140 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Without any uh, embrittlement <laughs> issues. Fortunately, 
I haven't had any opportunities to uh, test it at that temperature. <laughs> if, if you're there, you've got bigger issues. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, one thing I have, I, I, I did learn about the old school metal ones that um, so many of these have evolved from is that they don't work. Uh, they don't work when they're wet. Yeah. The, they they if they get they really are the old metal ones. They they mark it as sand ladders. You know that's kind of where the term came from. And, and I've learned the hard way that they really uh, don't function in much other than sand. Yeah. Um. So that's that's one of the nice advantages about about the new composites is they work in sand, snow, mud, rock, just about anything you might want to um, use them in. I would like to say uh, on that note, uh, one of the most interesting pieces of information I probably have regarding recovery tracks is that, is that most people don't realize that um, the recovery track is a U.S. invention that's over 100 years old. Hmm. The huh. first recovery tracks were patented in the U.S. in 1912. There has been uh, some variation of that approximately every decade patented, whether or not whenever ever went to, pr- to production is, a, is a, as many twisted and sorted tales as there are inventors, I'm sure. But um, our action tracks are by no means a copy of anything. They are just <laughs> merely the latest evolution of a, a longstanding American product. We are glad to be back in America producing finally. That's awesome. Yeah, I know, you know, there's a lot of competition. There's there's some very similar designs out there. Um and I think what probably sets you apart, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the material uh that you guys are using. Is that true? The the, the main so if you take the very best, the the best if you walk out and you buy the the two best tracks or the two or three, you know, two, two there's there's some middle tier ones. And, and if you go across the spectrum and uh, you'll find the first difference is is the thickness and the design uh, is what you'll feel first. Uh, um, there, there needs to be some quantity of material in there. A lot of people don't want to spend any money on uh, a bigger molds that can mold more expensive th- thicker materials of course costs a lot more to manufacture um, we we do all our molding through uh, a single injection point in, in a giant mold the size of a block of samurai steel uh, that costs as much as a, a nicely appointed house um, <laughs> the and that but and that that little advantage which pushes us out towards the edge of what's possible with the jet injection molding but it creates the fact there's no micro barrier flow lines or what they call knit lines within the uh, uh, molten material. Um, then, then you go to, yeah, how much do you want to spend? Do you want to spend uh, 65 cents a pound on polypropylene BBs or do you want to spend uh, uh, $3 a pound for reinforced nylon like some of the best? Or are you going to go and spend $6 a pound like I do for uh, experimental um, experimental material that they make uh, train car coupling bushings out of, um, and and so I got to be honest, I'm probably the lowest the lowest profit margin manufacturer you will ever <laughs> run into. If I if I told you the profit margins I'm manufacturing at, they're 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 not even feasible. But yeah. that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because we love it. We we go town to town selling this. We did this for the military and for our racers, and 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 that's why we do it. You know, we're we're in it to break even and bring a great product, not not make a lot of money. Yeah, I think right now where the you know the I don't know the state of the Overland community, if you want to call it that, is it's most people just want to have uh, any kind of traction pad or traction mat on their vehicle uh, just because it looks cool. Um, and, you know, it, we're talking low traction uh, type environments where somebody is, if they're going to buy something to help in recovery, they're looking at either a winch, a traction pad, 
uh, or a two by six with some bolts in the bottom. <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah. those are right? about the options. Um, why yeah, would somebody use plenty of those in Mexico? <laughs> oh yeah, well you know, like we were talking about ingenuity and necessity, it all kind of goes together. Yeah, um, that's right. But, but why why would somebody want to get if they only had four hundred dollars to spend, or if they only had two hundred fifty dollars to spend, why should they get uh, the traction pads versus a a winch? Well, you're not going to get much of a winch for two hundred fifty bucks. This is the last time I checked. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, this is true. <laughs> um, the I, I have a I have a beautiful twelve. 12,000 pound worn winch on my truck and I just uh, I don't use it a, a lot because um, the okay so so that's a great question you've only got a couple hundred bucks that's what led me to this whole that's what led me to this position I, I missed a I'm, I'm, I've won a race by 15 seconds a 250 mile race in Nevada on our way to the Baja 1000 a decade ago. And I said, we dug for hours stuck out there. I said, there's got to be a better way. And I went out and I bought, we were already using cut up uh, chain link fence, carpet scraps, all the normal stuff, carrying, uh, uh, you know, carrying foxhole shovels with us. And I said, there's got to be a better way. So I went out and I bought every single contraption there was. Uh, X jacks, you know, you run off your exhaust system tracks and and that's where i got involved at a really early date with uh, uh some of the some of the import traction recovery boards where they were having more uh, more more purchases overseas like i said it was even though it was an american invention really it comes down to where are the roads the worst um that's where you're gonna sell them we, you're, as a traction recovery guy, my perfect country has terrible roads and a very healthy <laughs> income for its citizens, like Canada. <laughs> so yeah. that's next on our target. Because I got to be honest, America has great roads. I go to the end of the line all the time, and there's still pretty dang good roads out there. And I get stuck all the time too. But uh, the traction recovery boards are just your 95% go-to item. Uh, down and dirty, grab it, throw it out, throw it down, and use it. Um, and you know, worry about the worry about the results. Uh, you know, hopefully it works. Worry about the getting out the heavy equipment later. Yeah. Um, I was surprised. You mentioned a lot of people just want them on their car. I just came back from a, a large expo where I had an absolutely great time, and it was just muddied in three feet deep uh, uh, in the North Carolina area. Some of you may have heard about it. Oh, yeah. And uh, absolutely great time, but I was shocked to see how many people had recovery tracks on their vehicle, but yet had never taken them off the car. Or well, they get dirty. Seem- they get dirty if you take them off. <laughs> well, that's what I, that's that's what I quickly realized. <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit dumbfounded as I was walking around recovering oh, 20, 30 people, uh, you know, an hour um, to see that they really had their own equipment but it had never been used. And 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 that's something I want to encourage people is, is that these are made to get down, get dirty, use them, tear this stuff up, go push it to the end of the line. And, uh, uh, you know, don't worry about keeping it clean. Um, yeah. that's, that's our word from the desert racing community. Go beat all your gear up and, uh, whatever survives, put it back in the truck, the rest of it throw away. <laughs> I think, I think that's where traction mats really shine is the majority of your stucks are really just, just, a I need to throw something down yeah. just to get up and out of it and get my momentum back up. You know, that's really all you need. You don't really need a winch for a lot of your stuck situations. You know, you just need something to throw down real fast and get you out of that little tiny hole or over that rock or whatever it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So often you just need uh, – or, or in Mexico, we just uh, – in the races, a lot of times two or three teenagers will just pop up out of the cactuses and start pushing. Yeah. And sometimes that's all you need. Really, you just need a little – you know, just a tiny just bit that. of oomph. Yeah, and, and and if you've got recovery boards, the other thing is is you can go ahead and stop right away. Uh, you know when you lose traction before you just bury it 
to the frame and get mm-hmm. high centered and everything else. Just stop, throw out, throw them down. Uh, going backwards is a completely completely legitimate direction to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and go either forwards or backwards. Uh, move on, reassess, and, and uh, continue on with your adventure. Yeah, and but, hit it with bigger skinny pedal next time. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> More power. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's one thing people are always surprised to find out about desert racing is that uh almost all of our vehicles are two-wheel drive and they yeah. say well how do you get how, how do you keep from getting stuck and we say we just never slow down just don't and, stop <laughs> and that's really really the trick momentum is your friend that's awesome well that's awesome well casey thanks for joining us tonight um again his website is usaactiontracks.com uh it's a great product take a look at it you can find his videos on youtube he puts them up on facebook every once in a while too so yeah thanks guys look for me out there i'm on facebook and instagram at uh uh kc just like kansas city kc action tracks uh YouTube Desert Warrior D E Z E R T, and I uh, I love your podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me on. And uh, uh, anytime you want to talk desert racing, just ring me up. Awesome, thanks, Casey. Have a great night, guys. All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay, so uh, Rich, uh, I see you've added a little bit here. Uh, last time we talked about you getting the uh, the white knuckle off road sliders. Uh, is the plan changing, or are you just reprioritizing well i got to thinking about it i was like i w- when i got my toner cover i went with the undercover uh ridgelander toner cover which is great because you have the rhino rack that you can put on top of that toner cover so i can put a basket i can carry my mountain bikes i can carry kayaks whatever um the only reason i really got it was because i was on a time crunch before that trip to colorado and i wasn't gonna be able to order a topper in time so now I'm thinking, <laughs> should I go yeah. more functional, everyday functional, and get that ARE topper that I originally wanted and put the sliders on the back burner? Because, well, let's face it, the, the topper I'll use on a daily basis, sliders, not so much. <laughs> no, but when you do need them, you're going to want them. Well, and see, but the thing is, is I don't... I don't really wheel like I used to. I don't really wheel where sliders are going to be that important. I say that, of course, and I've got a dented end pinch. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to say the words. Here's the other thing, though, and this is kind of what got me thinking about it, is you're right. You know, I don't do a ton of rock crawling with my truck, but I do hit a lot of gravel roads. Have you yeah. taken a peek at what your uh, oh, yeah. those rocker panels look like after hitting a lot of oh, gravel? Yeah, I know. Plus, I mean, it would. Br- I mean, we got a ton of snow right now. It would be handy in the snow too. It keeps a lot of that crap off the side of the truck. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going back. I'm so indecisive, you know. <laughs> uh, well, so which which uh, cap are you looking at then? The ARE overland series mainly because it's also got like a 500 pound capacity on top of it for the roof rack too so which is not common in toppers yeah so is the topper itself thicker to kind of support the extra weight so uh actually it's an option and you have to specify the option when you order it this may have changed because i was on their website earlier and some of the accessories were different but um you actually have to order it with a heavy-duty top to accept the, the roof rack. Huh. So there's something they're doing differently just in the manufacturing of it Yeah. for the heavy-duty rack. Well, hmm. So I assume you'd get that color matched and everything? It automatically comes color matched. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's pretty sweet. Is it a know. paint or is it – what kind of finish is that? Oh, I don't know if it's a, like a gel coat or what, but – it just says body colored match is standard. Interesting. Well, how how far has this gone? Have you gone on and talked to a dealer or uh I emailed Cody at four by four land in Topeka and said, Hey, that quote you gave me last year, is that still good? <laughs> so <laughs> And the answer was no, <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, okay. 
Well, I can't help you pick that one up, though. But you can still buy me the rockers, and I'll tell you how they work out. Or I could sell you a tonu cover. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I know my my wife probably wouldn't mind that. But so I've got the Lund, uh, the roll up, and it's really just a soft skin uh, right. cover. But I really like that it doesn't take up any room. It doesn't add hardly any weight at all. And when it's rolled up all the way, so you can use the bed as an actual bed, mm-hmm. um, it it sits super nice and low. Like you can't even see it through the back window. So, so one of the reasons I went with the undercover was it looked like it was fairly easy to take on and off. Yeah. And I was like, well, if I ever need to haul something big, I'll just take that t- toner cover off. Well, it turns out it's not as easy as you think. Um, there's a lot of rubber gaskets that you have to get lined up just right. And if they're not sealed up right, then you get water penetration. So it's not as easy as you would think it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so how soon are you looking at getting something like that? As soon as Cody emails me. No, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that's there. You go. Okay, I think he's made up his mind. But yeah. there is um, another option that I have seen out there is that uh, new can the new bed shell that actually. Uh, the one that hydro- lifts, yeah, yeah it hydraulically you can, lifts up. Yeah, you you can add that to any topper, so so you can well, still do the ARE over on the topper and then add that hydraulic lift. Or it's, yeah. I don't know, it's probably I don't know if it's hydraulic. It's probably not, but uh, yeah, you can add that lift to it. You know, the interesting thing about that lift though is is you can leave the topper in the raised position and do highway speeds. Stop it! <laughs> yeah, you can. You'd no, also you look like a fool. Because- <laughs> yeah well no they they actually makes they made it so it can raise up you can put a quad in there and you can still drive with it up and it won't blow over so then when you get where you're going you can pull your quad out and lower huh. it back down for bigger for bigger items um but there's one piece that you can do it's a tent yeah that it's yeah. inside there so it raises up and it's a tent inside I go back and forth on that idea, but um, so I've, I've, this whole time I've been thinking that there is a company that makes toppers that is just down the street from you, uh, in in large terms, and it's uh, ATC truck covers. Um, yeah, that's where I bought my hardtop for my first Jeep, my YJ. Okay, I went to the factory and bought my uh, my top from there. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Because yeah. I, I remember when I was looking at, at toppers as well, uh, you know, in Alaska, it was kind of hard to – pretty limited options there. But they're the LEX model. Uh, standard features include the solid front window, a frameless uh, glass and the side uh, panels, um, the frameless uh, – let's see, the tip-out side windows, the carpeted headliner, the rubber seal that you're talking about. It's got LED lights inside, tinted glass. Um, it's got the, the third brake light built in. Uh, let's see. A honeycomb reinforced roof, uh, for your, your rack, like you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. And here it is limited lifetime warranty on paint and structure. So they've got some other pretty cool, uh, optional features too. So one of the things that I learned about toppers, um, the ARE one has a, uh, uh, the the rear window, it would actually be the front window and the topper. Actually, you can fold it inward, yeah, which makes it so you can clean the back of your truck window and the outside of the topper window, yeah, without having to remove the topper. <laughs> Is that one of the standard features, or no? It's an optional feature okay. for it. Yeah, I actually yeah. was just looking at. Th- that's one of the accessory upgrades for the ATC ones. So yeah. Anyway, it looks like a pretty close uh, facsimile or competition or whatever you want to call it. Worth checking out, maybe. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, uh, Craig, how about you? What have you been working on? Um, just more like refilling the bank just account. Just work. <laughs> really, just work. Yeah. Um, it's it's so hard uh, coming back from SEMA. 
because I got so many things in my head about SEMA and it's like getting them all straightened out. Honestly, it, it's, it's not a one man show. When I went, I, I thought I'm like, Oh, I can do this. I can do that. Yeah. You can't do it by yourself. Every person that I saw there that was uh, it, doing the media thing, they had a partner. Yeah. They had somebody with them. Yep. Well, I, I got it. I got the hint. I wish I could have gone, but I couldn't. I uh, no, it. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty because, I mean, it's not cheap to go. No, well, I wish um, I could have gone. But, yeah, I just wish we were a little closer together because then I yeah. could sit down. We could sit down with this the paperwork here and, and go through it. And, um, I mean, I'm getting emails and and – almost every other day I'm getting emails from SEMA and getting invited to di- other shows that there's no way we, I could go to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, there'll yeah, be other years I, I'm sure. Yeah. Once we get this balanced out a little bit better, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, but yeah. we got to do something. I'm going to have to figure out something. Well, you know, do a little bit better. So, and, uh, get some better equipment yeah uh, uh definitely the figured out that the home computer is going out so it's time for a laptop oh, that man. i can take with me and we can <laughs> we can actually do some yeah. stuff so do some better stuff i should say yep well it so i had originally planned i think last we talked uh i was planning on going to the king of the hammers uh this week and i don't think it's going to work out unfortunately um but the reason is good. Uh, I had kind of an unexpected uh, string of events where all my family is going to be in town. So I haven't had my dad and my brother and his family and my sister and her family all in the same place at the same time for probably five years. Uh, so I've I've abandoned my hopes of going to King of the Hammers, which was going to be a pretty limited opportunity to be there anyways uh, to spend some time with family. Uh, so in that's out the window. Uh, but I have been playing with, uh, APRS on a ham radio. Uh, so I had that on a radio that I had uh, a while back, but it never did function like I had hoped. Um, so I, what I've come to, to, to realize is it, it's better just to have a dedicated APRS setup on, on the vehicle. So you have two different radios for two different purposes, which Certainly is not as cheap, uh, but a lot of the radios that you're running APRS on are pretty expensive anyways. So I've got my kind of lower-end regular ham radio for talking uh, on the trail, and then one for, for sending the signal. And so what I've done is there's a an application called APRS Droid, and I have a old Android phone that doesn't have service. Uh, it, it, it is just an Android phone. And then a cable uh, that I think I bought for $18. Uh, I'll try and find the link and put it on, on the show notes. And it connects the, the phone from the headphone jack to the, the uh, little Baofeng radio uh, that's got those same kind of connectors where it's got two pins. One's for the mic and one is for the, the speaker. And then I'll hook that up to an external mag mount antenna that I already have until I get a better antenna mount. And so you just set the volume to the right uh, level about midway through on both the phone and the radio so that they can talk to each other and broadcast at the right volume. And so now I have a setup that beacons my location as I'm driving around and it, it receives the signals from other APRS stations. You can actually send text messages with it uh, all just through the, the ham radio uh, network. So you have to be able to hit what's called a digipeter. And where I'm at on the other side of a mountain, uh, mountain range, it's a small mountain range, but it is a range. And I thought for sure there's no way any signals are getting out of here. Um, so I just left it in my Jeep running one day at work. Uh, since it's not connected to the battery, it's just however long a cell phone battery lasts without pinging a network uh, and how long a ham radio battery uh, lasts. And I was actually... I, I can't believe the, the distance. I was being heard and receiving signals from over 350 miles away. So we're talking wow. a $25 radio, a $20 cable, and a 
piece of junk Android phone that I already had laying around. That's amazing. Mm. So <laughs> technology. <laughs> yeah. So now that's something I can just kind of use whenever I go out on the trails, and and it certainly does work better uh, with a an external antenna. But this radio is only putting out five watts, just five watts. Uh, a, a lot of the other radios, like the other radio I run for for actually trail communications, is a fifty watt radio. And you know, like we talked about on uh, the interview and everything with Midland, uh, most of those handhelds are like half a watt or four watts. And, and it's still a giant step up from CBs, but uh, it, it's just amazing. I, I can't believe how well that's worked uh, for, for such mm, a low-budget yeah. solution. So, And if somebody is interested in kind of seeing what uh, you can do with APRS, if you go to aprs.fi, uh, because it's run by somebody outside the United States, the website is, uh, you'll actually pull up a map of all the stations that are beaconing and you can cruise around. It's the entire world. Uh, go look in your area and see what vehicles are cruising by. There's police stations, there's weather stations. Uh, and actually, you know, when you look on the, you know, the nightly news or whatever weather app you pull up, those weather stations are actually transmitting all that weather data using the APRS little known fact, uh, which is kind of cool. So, is that something you guys are interested in uh, or see yourself using, or is it just a total nerd thing? I don't know. Uh, I could probably see myself using it. So, uh, not me. I got enough electronic <laughs> crap I play with. Uh, I probably would buy one yeah. and put it in and probably never use it. So for me, it'd probably be a waste of money. Yeah, well, like I said, it is interesting. Just just go to APRS.fi, and uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, in like kind of the upper right corner, you'll see that something looks like a little crosshairs, and it'll take you to your location, and you can see all the stations that are beaconing, uh, and it, it'll surprise you. I'll say that for sure. Okay, well, now it's time to start wrapping up the show. Uh, so we have a voicemail uh, from Larry Hazelwood. Let's see if I can hit play on this and it'll go. Hey, 4x4 Podcast. This is Larry Hazelwood. I've been listening to the 4x4 Podcast since 2011. So I guess it's about time I sent you guys a voicemail. Um, I got into off-roading. Uh, as a young lad, I liked all the long travel trucks and all that. And after many failed attempts at building them and then starting a family, I needed to switch over and I wanted to do more of wheeling, camping and adventuring. So I got a vehicle to accommodate that. And I also got into listening to a lot of podcasts, uh, around that same time. And I thought, Hey, let me see if there's an off-road podcast. So I typed in off-road podcast, of course, and the 4x4 podcast came up, and it's been a wrap ever since. Um, if you're just now listening, you need to go and hit subscribe and uh, start from beginning till recently because I, you won't regret it. It's full of awesome information, products, companies, everything. Uh, Dan is a, f a phenomenal human being, a serviceman, family man, awesome dude, down to earth. Rich and Craig are awesome. The whole crew is great. Um Thank you guys for putting in the work and the years to make this podcast happen. I know myself and many others appreciate it. Um, again, awesome job, fellas. It's always refreshing to hear you. Uh, take care. Be safe. Well, Larry, thank you very much for that uh, that voicemail. That is uh, probably one of the most touching voicemails that we have ever received, actually, come to think of it. Um, so that's pretty awesome. We'll have to package that up as a an ad that's uh pretty good words for <laughs> for everybody <laughs> maybe help get some new listeners so uh and, and then on that note you know we really just appreciate everybody that continues to listen uh episode after episode and continues to come back after the long breaks between episodes um for all of the different reasons uh but really telling your friends about the show is one of the biggest ways that you can help uh, the show continue to grow 
So now we've got a couple reviews here. Uh, says uh, This is from Eugene. says, great content with a lot of 4x4 information in a somewhat regular basis. I got gotcha, you. I know. <laughs> Love the reviews and all the 4x4 scene info. Keep it going. And the other one is from Willie. Uh, he says, the one thing every overlander does is drive long distances to find the best trails we can find. Well, this podcast will make that journey not only very enjoyable, but also very educative. If you are into overlanding or 4x4 related issues, this is your podcast to listen to. Peace out. And he goes by the Lone Overlander on uh, Instagram. And actually, that's how I stumbled across his post. Uh, it just happened. Like I, I follow different hashtags on Instagram, and one of them is the Mojave Road. And uh, his post popped up under that hashtag, uh, Mojave Road. And what do you know, he was listening to the Mojave Road episode while driving on the Mojave Road. How crazy is that? <laughs> uh, well, guys, I think that is it for episode 141. Uh, all the show notes for this episode will be at uh, the 4x4podcast.com slash 141. And if you want to share this episode, you can actually just... The, the shortened link is the 4x4podcast.com slash 141mp3. Uh, that's always, and I guess this is how if somebody wants to try and sneak a early episode or something, uh, just use the episode number, mp3, and that'll take you straight to the, the podcast file itself. Um, if you want to reach out to us, you can shoot us a voicemail uh, like we've received here recently at 719 924 Five three three seven. That does spell Jeep, but obviously we are not just Jeep people. Uh, and then in our website, you can hit that uh, Skype, or not the Skype, but the uh, what's it called? Speak pipe, uh, like Larry did here in this episode. And of course, email uh, is the four by four podcast at yahoo.com. I know I must be the only person still using Yahoo. Uh, and and on Instagram, we the Instagram community has really boomed. Uh, recently, and of course, still Facebook and Twitter. We do use all of the social medias. So that is it. Uh, we will look forward to hearing all the feedback on how uh, we should not be driving Ram trucks. We should be driving something else. Send in the hate mail. <laughs> it's fine. I can take it. All right, that's it for now. So stay safe out there while exploring your world. <laughs> <laughs>